It's a very tense time in the wizarding world. There was a denial that Voldemort even existed anymore because he was supposed to be dead. There was no chance that the Dark Lord could re-emerge and threaten the wizard world and the muggle world. And we discover at the end of Order of the Phoenix that he's definitely back. And so the beginning of Half-Blood Prince is cloaked in this tension of not knowing when the Dark Lord will appear and who's going to strike first. So everyone finally acknowledges that Voldemort is back. This is scene three of the movie, and it's to show that the Death Eaters are very much still around, and the first thing that they do is collapse this beautiful bridge. We wanted to find an iconic London landmark that we could really make uh, very bad things happen to, and uh, the Death Eaters attacking the Millennium Bridge seemed to be something that could become an iconic moment. It's a combination of live action and background plates, both from the air and from the ground and from various heights. We're moving the uh, closure now. Uh, that's our first helicopter run done. Our next one. Uh, we coordinated with David Yates, the director, and also with the production department on the second unit. He says what he wants, and then we try to achieve that. And we coordinate very closely with the visual effects department. It's very political, flying low in the center of a big city. And there's a lot of worry about safety, of course and also nuisance to the public. So we absolutely minimize the amount of time we're down at low altitude. So we're using a Eurocopter twin scroll helicopter. That's a safety issue, really. We want an extra engine to protect us, give us better performance, and also to protect us in case something fails. And we're using a West Cam gyro-stabilized camera system with a Mitchell camera and a long 10 to 1 zoom lens to be able to get closer to the bridge. Okay, we've got it. And we transmit the signal of what we're filming by microwave to the ground so the second unit director and the visual effects people can see instantaneously what we're doing. And they explain what we want, we explain what our limitations are, and we come to a solution that keeps it safe. We're on the uh, north side of Millennium Bridge here. Uh, this side of the bridge is covered by the City of London Police. The south side of the bridge is covered by the Metropolitan Police. And we're two distinct forces, police forces. And uh, we've just been asked to come down here and assist with crowd control uh, as necessary and to help with closing the, the bridge when the uh, filming's taking place. Potentially it's restrictive, but on a movie like Harry Potter, there's a huge force of collaboration that seems to occur, and the location department do an amazing job. People from many different agencies working together to, to make the day work. The Port of London Authority, the City of London, the Police, Westminster, the South Bank Authorities, the Tate Modern, uh, the general public. Uh, it's been an amazing day of multi-agency collaboration. sixth film. We went to a variety of locations, in part because David was very big on authenticity and reality, and also in part connecting with today. And he enjoys being out there in the real world. Um, he thinks it helps bring a certain verisimilitude to the piece. but also, quite frankly, there's only so much we can fit within these stages. They've been very generous to us, they're fantastic spaces, but we need more locations. So we went to various cities and places to film. Since the story is set in a slightly parallel universe to our own, it's a slightly heightened uh, world uh, based on the world that we know. So we can do location filming, and we're also just a bit ridiculous to try and build every set. So we've been to Gloucester Cathedral, that's got uh, things that we, uh, we couldn't really build. And to Durham Cathedral where we've been before, we've been down to Laycock because we needed a really sort of charming, quintessentially English village. And it works beautifully on the screen. There's some good little outings there, really. I think the crew enjoy it enormously, going out on location. As a design thing, I think the real world is potentially dangerous. It's full of uh, extraneous things that you don't really need. There's these five things. Yeah. Could be safe. Yeah. For this sequence, I find myself tending to strip things away and also to make it more theatrical. Continuous, yeah. yeah. 
And I think if you stay and build things in, in these stages, everything is of your choosing. So it's a mixed thing. It's a pleasure to go, but uh, there are design issues. I think Joe Rowling recognises that everybody in a certain degree is fallible and the thing for anybody is to try and lead a good life. And ultimately, Slughorn is this man with a terrible secret. He gave the young Voldemort some information which has allowed Voldemort to gain such a purchase on power. And Slughorn is partly responsible for that by giving him this piece of information. And I think Slughorn is basically saying, look, I was fallible. My vanity and my pride and my fear meant ultimately that I was foolish enough to give this information. That notion that we have choices throughout our lives to lead a good life or to, to take the wrong turn, I think is a constant in, in the books and is a constant in, in these films. Jim Broadbent was the newest addition to our acting troupe, and he is the perfect slughorn. What you see before you, ladies and gentlemen, is a curious little confection. I've worked with David before, and have uh, good communication, and we had a few conversations about different types of uh, teachers and, and, and the character, and his uh, vulnerabilities and his strengths, and all, all those sort of character things, which is, David's very good at homing in on the essentials of a character and giving you an area in which you can build a character. 453, take one. I think Slughorn as a character is someone who people nowadays will be able to see a lot of the world around him because he's obsessed by celebrity and he's obsessed with the idea of, of sort of reflected glory and all his former students who have gone on to great things. He has pictures of them on his wall. And the other ones who didn't do anything particularly spectacular, he discards, you know, he doesn't care about them. So he's totally mercenary like that, but at the same time, there's something quite charming about him because he's... He's very vulnerable. You know, he's not like the first time he was at Hogwarts when he was kind of in his prime. Yeah, Potter, to life! <laughs> when I first read the book and then the script, even though Jim isn't physically as Joe describes Slughorn, he knows that character inside out. And I knew his capacity for both comedy and for pathos would absolutely bring so much to the table for Slughorn. I carried on down, I turned around to see my chap, but he was still at the top of the hill. <laughs> and he comes up with such witty, interesting, odd, crazy things sometimes. And Jim can take a fairly benign line and he can elevate it into something that is purely comic, which I really love. The three broomsticks and I go way back further than I care to admit. I remember that it was called the one broomstick. <laughs> one of the big themes is friendship and the boundaries of friendship and what you um, what you get from your friends and how your relationships with your friends evolve and change over time, and how friendship is often as special as any other kind of relationship. The key thing, obviously, is it's about growing up and discovering the world and discovering the boundaries of the world and the limits of the world and the, and the way the world can become quite complex, and that's continued even more in this story. Six Story really deals with the relationships a lot, with Rupert and his first relationship with Lavender Brown. So it's got lots of sexual and emotional politics, which is really good. So we're seeing the characters we love discovering much more profoundly the opposite sex. Apparently it's his lucky day. The romance and everything that is in the film is very, very strong. It does set the tone as being sort of more mature from the word go, I think, this time around. It's much more of a romantic comedy. It's much more about relationships and the trials and tribulations of of love. Harry sort of has a crush on Ginny. Ginny's going out with Dean Thomas, but she sort of likes Harry, and they can't really tell each other what they feel. Similarly, Ron likes Hermione, Hermione likes Ron, but again, neither of them can really express themselves, uh, so it leads to many comic mishaps and uh, plenty of romantic awkwardness, something that we all can relate to in some form or another. It's just enormous fun. And actually, it has the best of what the books have, I think, in the sense that it's great fun one minute, incredibly intense the next, and very moving the moment after that. It has all these gear changes. It's a film filled with humanity, um, compassion, great relationships, 
and um, also some great sort of scary and exciting scenes. It's a story that I think is incredibly moving, uh, very romantic, very tender and uh, filled with emotion. And action. Both cameras on time. Roll camera. And then everyone goes, it's going to get a big blast of something going up. And assuming. And I think these films, with the amount of visual effects and the length of the shooting schedule, complexity of the stories, they're huge, huge things for a director. Most of them get to the end and think, oh, that was brilliant, but now I need a rest. And David Yates got to the end and thought, that was great, I'd love to have another go. Let's check the gate, guys. All right, good. Check it again. Check it again. I loved working with David on the fifth film. was the just the best experience I've had on any of the films. So the fact that he came back for the sixth film is remarkable. It was difficult to resist coming back. Five is quite intense and emotional and wrought, and six is actually quite a lot more playful. And if we can feel it collectively, then we might get something special this evening. So you have to all start tuning in and making it quite real. They had so much fun making The Order of the Phoenix. Such a lovely bunch of people, not just the producers in the studio, but Dan, Rupert, Emma. Just show me that look. Um... And he's still got the same energy, the same vibrancy, and he's just a joy to work with. Every time I get on set, I look forward to seeing him, because he's got a genuine enthusiasm about him, which is really great. <laughs> there was a real family atmosphere making these films, and also I just felt I had more business to do here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to film it like a documentary. Collapsing, sure. It was an interesting feeling, because book five leading to book six, there are all sorts of links through. I just felt I hadn't quite done everything I wanted to, not just for me as a storyteller, but also with the actors. I wanted to see them play more comedy, because we didn't get that much of a chance at comedy in five. Five was all about the trials and tribulations of learning how complicated the world is. Whereas six, I mean, it's got its intensities and its dark moments, but it's actually quite fun. <laughs> and I really wanted the opportunity to work with them again and to have not just fun behind the cameras with them, but also fun on screen. And that's what six is offering. Having David back was great. I mean, he is a formidable director. The variety and depth of his talent is immeasurable. And what I love most is that the most important thing for him in all the films, besides telling a good story, is the humanity and is the characters. And I think he draws sides out of actors that I have never seen before. And that was really exciting. And I think you see things in Dan, Rupert and Emma, not to mention Michael and the others that we haven't seen in previous Harry Potter films. He's a great director and I feel really Thrilled that he's back. Yes! Yes! Bang on! <laughs> it's a documentary. One of the first memories that Dumbledore shows Harry is that of when Dumbledore met Tom Riddle, who went on to become Lord Voldemort. Dumbledore met Tom Riddle at Wool's Orphanage. And you see Dumbledore going up to see him, and Tom is, is very young, you know, he's around 10 years old. And we see him seated in a corner, and they have a conversation, and Tom talks about how he's different. That's fine, you know, Dumbledore's different too, and that's a form of connection. But the key is really what you do with your difference, and what choices you make. Before we build things, we do a bit of research and there's usually something that we find that sparks an idea that gives us a direction. And so for Wool's Orphanage, we found the most amazing building in Docklands, Liverpool, red brick Victorian building, which was really quite sort of brutal, but an interesting kind of architectural way with classical allusions and so on. So this is based on that. Um, in front of the building. The gateway here is a kind of echo of David Lean's Oliver Twist. Starts with the girl crossing the moor, pregnant Oliver's mother, and then going into the workhouse, in fact, and there's this creaky old metal sign. So this is a little bit of homage to David Lean up there. And the interior is this Victorian glazed tile because it had good, long-lasting cleaning properties. No detail, really, very simple. It's a very distinctive look and a good, oppressive, dark look, I think. Back for an action. Action. We now have a stock London street 
on the back lot here at Leavesden. So this represents our stock street. Well, actually, we have half a permanent street. We have that side of the street. And we, we use that side, as modern films do, to create this side. It's a visual effects. It's a digital set extension. The orphanage is situated at the end of a rather derelict street, in the middle of all this admittedly dilapidated but rather refined London Georgian architecture. So Wool's Orphanage, it's not a warm and friendly place. It's really quite brutal. So it stands out in a, in a really striking, iconic way. very much excited about Ron's scenes with Lavender because I took a fair bit of stick when I kissed Katie in the last film so it was time for revenge this time around. Daniel Radcliffe was definitely there. Oh, no, his presence was known on the, the kissing scene day. I think he even came back when he wasn't on camera just to be there. Yeah, I took days to calm down. I don't think Rupert had done a kissing scene. Uh, that was entirely new territory for him. Well, he was actually quite lucky because when he did his scene, he was on his own, he was just him and Katie. This time on the scene, it's pretty packed, so a little bit more embarrassing, I think. But I just said to try and get over it. Yeah. <laughs> it was really nice to see Ron's first kind of experience of this girl and having a, a kiss. I wasn't really aware of the fact that there would be around 70 or 80 extras. But actually, I think that probably made it easier. It's just such a weird sort of thing. You've got everyone watching you, and it just doesn't feel very sort of natural. For me, the only awkward part was the rehearsal, where it was just me, David, and Rupert. And so, that was way more intimate than this, this kind of scene of all these people. This cheering noise going on. So I don't think how happy Rupert was about it, but I think it went OK. I hope it went OK. I was more concerned anyway about honestly chipping a tooth. I really was worried. <laughs> which has appeared before in Harry Potter 2, and it's this very eccentric house, and Arthur Weasley has built this huge extension, not laterally, but vertically. The house is a tower with bits of old stained glass window, odd doors, the wood of all different sections, all different sizes, and it's highly sort of personal and homemade. And that tower looks great in a completely flat landscape, in a marsh, with this extraordinary noise of this long swishing reed and for the arrival of the Death Eaters. In the second unit, we've spent four or five nights out on the back lot. Action! Chasing through these wonderful sort of maze of reeds. It is a beautiful, eerie sequence. And one thing David is very keen on is giving the reeds a characteristic, a, a dimension, a darkness of their own. And it's very, very scary, the sense of being lost in these reeds and just hearing the wind in the reeds and finding these characters all looking for each other, all lost and realising that they're going to be attacked any moment. Harry. We have set the Burroughs house on fire using a full-size set and on a model. We also set the ring of fire around the house, which is about 420 feet, so it's a long ring of fire in terms of getting it there and controllability. So it's been a bit of a learning process for, for all concerned. We also spent a few days down in Dorset at a place called Abbotsbury 
where there's a wonderful reed bed on the edge of the Chesil Beach. And we did helicopter attacks on, on where the Weasley house would be there and we did lots of plate shooting so we can create the whole sort of horizon and environment around the house in, later on in visual effects. Then to tie in with the visual effects, we've got to do lots of elements of rolling fireballs and that sort of thing. We've been able to improve, build and grow with fires and flambos. And at the same time, the visual effects technology has improved as we've moved along. So the fact that we, we are able to do all these things and composite it together better, I think has improved every aspect of the Burroughs house. Action. Straight away, keep the red out, straight away one more. Yeah. It was actually the first scene I filmed, so I think that added to the kind of build up of what it was to be like. But I think it's difficult to kind of prepare yourself because you'll never know what, what it's like until it's over. That was kind of odd because when Katie Lung as Cho was, was cast, she was brought in and we were already aware she ultimately was the love interest. Whereas Bonnie, it was kind of odd because I've known Bonnie since she was about 10. So it's a bit weird doing all that, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> Let's roll, please. Victor 54, take one. But I think the first time is always the worst, but after that, it's just like any other scene that you're filming. So it was actually easier than I realised as it went on. Three on the end. Yeah, I think at first, when everyone comes in and have a look at the scene, you know, lighting or the crew, it's a bit embarrassing, but I think after a while, you just got to accept it and <laughs> get on. The key is just connecting with that. Sure. I think people, they want to tease you, but then they don't really want to make you really more and more awkward about it. So I think people were quite relaxed. I think it's also something that's quite hard to bring up to someone, because you don't really want to make them more awkward than they probably already are. I think everyone's tried to be kind about it because it's embarrassing enough, or it's difficult enough as it is. Dan's known Bonnie for a long time and then having to kind of kiss someone. It's quite a weird thing to have to do, so I think everyone's kind of tried to cut, cut each other some slack and <laughs> just kind of <laughs> give everyone the space to kind of try and do a good job, I think. I was talking with other people about kind of all those different things, you know, eat loads of garlic and fish and different things, but I think that's really cruel, so I did not for that one. I read a script. I was specifically really looking forward to doing the new Aragog. We had to make a completely new one because this one is dead. But he's essentially, it's the same character and he looks essentially the same. Although we've upgraded him a little. The aquatronic we built for Chamber of Secrets was a latex and polyfoam thing. You, you're Aragog, aren't you? Yes. I wanted him to have that same quality. And so we went with a solid polyurethane. It does produce a translucent quality, like a dead insect, whereby you can see an understructure through the surface. Because we wanted this translucent surface, we had a team of people who were literally just filling the moulds after it was sculpted and moulded. And there were sort of four or five people just continuously producing the pieces. Once you produce them, you then have to artwork them. So we were airbrushing a colour scheme into this uh, polyurethane. We were also flocking it in places whereby we can put a nice fuzz into places and direct where this fuzz goes. But then we had uh, six, seven people who had to sit there and put in all these large spider hairs, one at a time, with needles, over the whole spider. And of course, we had to build the spider in two scales as well, because any interaction with Robbie Coltrane as Hagrid, you have to resize everything he's in contact with. So there is a smaller scaled spider as well. So it was a huge amount of work. And when you see 16 spider legs all in a row and you know that you've got to punch hair into all of them, it's a little daunting. We had a team of people just doing hair for weeks. How do we um, stand just with one as we It obviously isn't cheap to construct 
a spider like that, but it's also incredibly expensive in CG. And I always fight the corner to do it practically if it makes sense. So it was a trade-off. I mean, as all these things, it's the cost, the ease of use on set, how much reference does it provide, you know, does it give something to the actors that couldn't handle if it's not there? Because when you build creatures like that, um, very often even just an inanimate object like that can have a, you know, a little emotive moment, which is nice. But because Hagrid literally has to push him in, we had to make him so heavy because he had to move as something that heavy would move. He needed, you know, dead weight. So we ended up building a very, very strong, heavy version that weighed three quarters of a tonne and moved beautifully and landed in the pit and survived. So we were happy with that and went along and it was very successful. Goodbye, friend of Hagrid. <laughs>
with trying to see how the crystals reacted to the light raking across because this flare would constantly travel around and so it wasn't a static lighting scenario for the set. It was constantly changing, very dynamic. Something as vast as a cave 2,000 plus feet large, you have trouble refracting and ray tracing that large of an environment. So we had to figure out a way to break it up in sections and handle the rendering efficiently. And then this is a shot that basically shows the cave in all its glory from about as wide of a camera view that we were able to get in the sequence. And it shows off a lot of interesting detail just in the cave itself. When we did the cave sequence, it was about 150 shots all strung together. So at the end of our work, we actually had the whole sequence that we can take a look at. It is a contained sequence. There's no shots where there's not visual effects in them. So we were just kind of dressing the cave to each shot to try to get a good composition with it. We learned more than we ever knew about caves and crystals and how large they could get and the light properties that happened in those instances. They had actually built a full-scale wall, uh, just a section, a column, actually, to represent how they wanted the strata to be because it was a very particular sense of, of order that they wanted to it rather than just a haphazard granite type structure. We use that as a, as a rough template to then propagate out to the rest of the cave. We wanted to realize an environment through Stuart Craig's vision that would be spectacular, but also very spooky and very dark and moody. So I think creating all of those sort of types of effects, you know, really is the joy of contributing to the film. It's pretty rare that we actually end up getting to where the artwork is because it tends to be extremely difficult to achieve some of that complexity. And I think we, I think we got it in that case. So I was really happy with that sequence. We have a creature called the Inferi in the sequence. They're sort of tortured souls that Lord Voldemort has stuck in the cave and has left there. And David Yates was very explicit about having them not feel like they're zombies. Actually, he wants you to feel actually bad for them. I and mean, what they're trying to do is really is, is sort of draw Harry in. And during the sequence, Harry actually gets pulled in underwater and the Inferi grabs him and starts sort of drowning him and, and dragging him down. That whole moment of him going into the water and getting pulled down is more of like a, an embrace rather than trying to you know, attack him or eat him or something like that. It was more about making a believable story because ultimately they were victims of Voldemort. They weren't there because they were killers themselves. So all of the visual effects people involved were careful that they were not making a sort of gory type horror film. The design itself is difficult that way because they, they do look very emaciated and very skinny, basically skeletal creatures. So the action and the animation tells the story that these aren't zombies. The design started in, in London and they started sending us lots of reference, photos, some artists that had done some interesting sculptures. Then they started actually building a, a sculpture over there, a maquette, which was life-size of one of these inferior. They got to a certain point in that sculpt, sent us pictures of that, and then we additionally did some artwork along with that to start defining things like hands, various heads, different hairstyles, because there's so many of them. We build one maquette, we really have to change that up and make it look different. It was kind of a collaborative effort with them to give us the look, and then we went in and modified faces, height, shape, that type of thing with the Inferi. I think ultimately, and what's really interesting about this director is that he always goes more for um, realism. So we basically just went to the track of just try to make them look as human as possible. And in a way, that's almost scarier because then hopefully you're actually believing that these things are crawling out of the water rather than making it some kind of weird creatures. We referenced a lot of prison camp type uh, survivors where they're very emaciated and they've been sort of tortured by their environment. It was some difficult reference to look at, but it definitely served in creating a look for these characters as well as sort of being ominous. They needed to not just be intimidating or scary, but they also need to be kind of sympathetic and tragic. 
In the movie itself, the inferior are fully computer generated, but they're based upon actions and the facial reference capture that they did in London as well as our motion capture here. For their actual acting or action, they hired some actors and the director had these actors go through various poses, maneuvers, and just expressions. Once we had that, we then additionally here at ILM did a bunch of motion capture because our animators actually wanted to control all of those rather than going for a crowd pipeline. So our animators went down to our motion capture stage and actually did a bunch of acting and, and then we brought those in and put them onto the Inferi. For me and for the team, it was the most complex work that they've given us. And I kind of feel like they really entrusted us with a nice sequence, you know, pretty major to the book. And we loved it, we loved working on it. It was important for Dan to have someone to hold him so he could act against. So we worked with the idea that we'd have an actor under the water in a green suit who could wrestle and fight with him so that Dan could deliver the performance that David wanted and also the actor could restrain him sufficiently so that he could sort of submerge and be pulled down underwater. We've replaced the actor holding Dan with a CG female in furry specifically designed for this task and we used a lot of facial reference that we shot ourselves, which we had David Yates direct, so that we could capture a performance of the actor who was going to play this particular Inferi and then map that performance onto the CG Inferi's face so that we had exactly the right expression that the director wanted. On the fourth film, there's a very big underwater scene where Harry had to do a lot of underwater swimming, so that was a very good experience and the tank that was built for that scene, we reused again. There's a technical aspect to shooting things so they worked in uh, underwater environments. In this instance, we maintain the idea of using a lot of interactive light to motivate a lot of the effects that we use later. So for instance, when the firestorm happens above the water, we used interactive light under the water so that you felt that there was an orange glow on Harry's face whilst he was actually escaping from the inferior. That's something that we were using above water as well as underwater, but the actual look of the environment underwater, we were very much developed in the computer. We developed the depth that you could see, the cave walls, and the fact that all of this environment was made of, of bodies, basically. A concept that we developed and sort of really brought to life in the actual computer itself.